to her in just a moment uh, and then we'll be crossing back to Johannesburg where Simon Burke is standing by with your news. Uh, that's a little bit later. Uh, in fact, uh, he's ready for us now. All right, we are able to interview Susan Boyce, and you'll be happy to know. Uh, we'll go back to Johannesburg a little bit later. L let's just wrap up quickly some of the main events uh, of the day. Um, the, the DA's Helen Zilla was supporting yeah. Herman Mashaba in Alex Township today, um, and, and the DA was hoping that he would help them in Joburg, but of course he's up against this very popular uh, mayor, Parks Tower. And then uh, the EFF went and knocked on the door of Tabo Mbeki. So, so first <laughs> Let's start with the <laughs> significance of, of that today. Yes, that's right. Well, it was a great publicity stunt, if I may call it a stunt. And I presume he didn't arrive uninvited. So it could have been, we know Tom Beke was very reluctant. We speak evidentially, very reluctant to go and actively campaign mm. for the ANC. We had President Zuma just assuring people Mbeki is indeed a member, uh, but he wasn't going to campaign. That her and the insults of the ousting of Mbeki, I guess, are just way too strong to go out and defend President Zuma in these circumstances. And I think that's identification of mutual enemies. Julius Malema and his uh, former ANC youth league people, of course, ousted by the Zumas in the ANC. And there, these minds meet, even if they are now in different parties mm. and no commitment to vote for each other. But uh, certainly a great stunt, I mm. think. Very yeah. interesting, because uh, if I remember correctly, there was a, a statement from Mbeki saying he's loyal to the ANC, but he hasn't got out there. And, and this was mm -hmm. definitely planned today because there were cameras inside his house. Oh. Okay, there we have it. That so was it absolutely trying to get a little sting in at the current leadership mm -hmm. of the big party. Um, he still feels ev about events that he still feels very, very hurt about. How do you think that will play out, though, over the next couple of days? You know, he, 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 if we talk about this uh, clash between the EFF and the ANC, it's going to be a fascinating set of events to follow on that mm. because the ANC is under attack by the EFF. EFF, of course, will not beat the ANC, but the EFF is taking a big chunk of support that otherwise most of it would have gone to the ANC if the EFF had not been there, perhaps mm. a little bit to the DA as well, but most of it would have gone to the ANC. And mm. so, and the ANC is not only now under attack by the DA, the EFF, but also by a range of independents like yeah. the Sini Itaquini municipality. It's the EFF's first local government elections. They haven't been mm. tested at a local government level in terms of these elections. In, back in 2014, they scooped mm. 25 seats. Uh, in terms of their campaign so far, how do you think it was run? You know, I think the campaign has been pretty effective. You know, they speak a certain line. They are consistent on that. They know they target audience of voters very well, unambiguous about it, mm. uncompromising in their policy stances. And that is probably what... And the target group is very young. So that's probably what those young people want. We can look at students, at unemployed people. They relate to the EFF and the EFF's message in a big way. Yeah. And coming into the first local government, government election is going to be a very important test yeah. for the EFF. We have seen other for small opposition parties, new opposition parties like the NFP now. Yeah. NFP had entered, National Freedom Party in Kwasulu Natal, had entered in local elections five years ago. Of course, now they are off the table. Yeah. We have seen it in a Congress of the People, COPE from National really declining into local government elections. Mm. And we know the EFF is setting out the ambition for itself to double or do treble yeah. its electoral support, which would make it by far the fastest growing political party in the country. You mentioned the NFP. Now, interesting developments coming out from KZN oh, of late. Uh, the certain supporters from the NFP endorsing the DA. What do you make of that? That is fascinating. It's totally unexpected, at least. I, I've, I'm pretty informed about the area. And really two both, two dogs, the IFP and the ANC, fighting about this mm -hmm. bone of the NFP. Many NFP people have been migrating back to the IFP, having become disillusions, or with the misfortune of the party leader, Zanele Kamkwa Samasibi, her illness, and not a party that's been very active, going back to the IFP. They're 
it, some of the leaders have said it's the IFP that has sabotaged their nomination campaign and went back to the ANC and here the DA comes. And very interesting part of that is the DA seems to be making these small gains. We know Abbasali Basmanjolo in a previous election 2014, they suddenly endorsed their DA. Mm. Fascinating. We know part of the Siskona People's Movement, the poo protesters in the Western Cape. Not the whole of that movement, but some of them have now gone and endorsed the DA. So the DA is collecting these interesting little enclaves of black African support. Mm. The, the, something that's been quite controversial uh, in the run-up is the polling, which shows that the DA is not gaining little bits here and there, but may gain huge metros. Um, <laughs> Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, Chwane, debate over Joburg, but, but you don't mm. uh, give much uh, credence to, to those polls. You know, the polls that we have seen in recent week, the regular weekly ones, have been all we've had, but we have had good information that their information, unlike in good polls, have not been filtered by whether people are registered to vote and whether those people whose opinions were sought actually intended voting. And it was also a panel sample. Panels start responding in fashionable ways. Mm. So that methodology was interesting, but not the most representative one. For sure, we know in all likelihood that DDA has been making major inroads, has been getting Gaining in support mm. and the ANC probably declining in support, but not to the extent it went to, that we've seen for the in metro polling. It's gone against all yeah. logic. So the chances are pretty good, and we also see it in latest adjustments where that filtering has probably been done. That yes, the ANC might have a lead in several of these metros, yeah. and we know also even if the ANC seeds those outright majorities in some of the metros. They would still have be by far the biggest party and would have a very the best chance, in fact, of all of the parties yeah. to stack together the little building blocks of small parties and yeah. independents to get over that benchmark of 50% of support. Yeah. These polls, do they actually affect how voters vote? They could very well. Mm. You know, in polling, we talk about the bandwagon effect and the underdog dog effect. The bandwagon is people jump on a bandwagon and go and support the biggest, the winning party. People like big, strong parties. Mm. And sometimes it's also a sympathy vote that they may go for the underdog effect. So there's a very big possibility that it might. We've seen it in Brexit, for example, those last mm. few days mm. before the actual vote that there was a ban on publication of opinion polls. We know in the United States the publication of East Coast election results are not allowed before the West Coast polls close with a time zone difference between the East and West Coast in a set to ensure that that does not have the bandwagon effect. I, I don't know about you, Blaine, but mm. I find this so interesting. Uh, regarding Brexit, they were saying that the um, Leave vote was mm. uh, not in the lead, so some <laughs> Remain voters became <gasps> yes. complacent, uh, mm. which is why we are not allowed to publish exit polls <laughs> on the day. It, it's yes. fascinating. Mm. Uh, if, if, if I can move to issues that have come up in campaigning, a lot of people mm. are saying the, the real issues affecting local governments have been ignored <laughs> in favour <laughs> of a whole lot of mudslinging. I do think policy issues, uh, the real issues mm. have been lost. That, that's really true, but there's also so much convergence between the different political parties. Sometimes mm. we listen to the advertisements also broadcast on SABC, and they sound so different. Uh, but only towards the end, where one see which party it is, where earlier parts, they go roughly on the same issues. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of policy convergence between political parties. And then people start moving about how well, with what kind of quality and how sustainable is the... Uh, delivery that we've seen. Yeah. So it's on slightly different nuances on that. And yeah. it comes to corruption and it comes to the quality of leadership, which is about how to implement roughly similar policies. And so it's not entirely off the agenda, but there are different nuanced ways yeah. in which they have been featuring. But these these are the real issues in terms of a local government election, isn't it? Service delivery, the, mm. the provision of water, electricity, yes. sewage. Uh, there's an interesting that in terms of the electorate uh, in this elections, about 55% are women, oh, yes. 45 being uh -huh. men. 
Do you think that uh, political parties should have tailored their campaigns accordingly or are these issues generic? The issues are really overwhelmingly generic. Which are the big issues? And they're not necessarily local government mm. issues, but they also feature strongly in this campaign. Unemployment, poverty. People are looking for uh, positions. They're looking to start small businesses or medium-sized businesses if they can get good contracts from municipalities and to get employment and lift themse- uplift themselves. There is a great amount of acceptance that everybody is entitled to to water, electricity, sewage removal, quality of housing, and then we start moving into national issues. Yeah. But the national issues, a big narratives and national issues were all over this campaign. And that is why many people in a way call it a referendum on the majority party to a large extent who's been in power in most of the municipalities. Are, are you sad that race featured so strongly? Um, a, a lot of talk about apartheid, uh, specifically in relation to the DA. Oh, and, yes. and while we're on that, it mm. seems like there's a shift. The ANC used to uh, seemingly strategically ignore the DA. Now we've had <laughs> Jacob Zuma um, attacking them in, in every public meeting I've seen. Uh, is, is that a compliment? Is, is that the right <laughs> strategy? Uh, does it not give them uh, more status, more, more profile? It was probably not a good strategy for the ANC to let his president rip into the DA because it focuses attention on the fact that Wow, the ANC, they think, they say on the one hand, they're very confident, having done their own opinion polls, that they are winning across the board. But then we know... But they in, looked in past, insecure. Exactly. In past election campaigns, the ANC has overwhelmingly ignored the DA and the strongest opposition parties, not giving credence to those messages that come from those parties. And here, there was a complete reversal of that, in a way saying the ANC is probably more worried than what they have acknowledged, conceded to be. And of course the the race issue, that's fascinating. A race issue uh, together with ancestors and uh, nasty animals that will come and get people if they don't continue voting for the big party. And those strategies I really think could have backfired. That's where we'll have to leave it. Professor Sir Suzanne Boyson, thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much indeed. We will be catching up uh, with the good professor in a little while to unpack more uh, election news. Uh, but first, let's take it back to Auckland Park in Johannesburg and get more sports news now.